Everything you're about to see is real. Remember that when you leave here tonight, you are all complicit, repugnant, and appalling! And I love you for it. And I welcome you, even as you disgust me. Hey, listeners, welcome to the show. I'm Danny. And I'm Mark. I'm Laura. And this is a spoilful podcast about Interview with the Vampire, Season 2, Episode 2. Do you know what it means to be loved by death? The synopsis for this week is Daniel struggles to navigate Louis and Armand's united front as the interview continues. They recount the story of how they first met, providing a deeper insight into their complex relationship and the dynamic within the new vampire community. Awesome. All right, let's go into uh, our general thoughts, Mark. Well, my overall thought about the episode, I love this episode. I can't say that it's my favorite of the season yet because we haven't finished the season yet. But this is something that I've been anticipating based upon what I've seen in the actual movie, what I've heard and what was put into the books of Interview with the Vampire. And this is like a pinnacle point uh, at this point within Louis and Claudia's life when they meet Armand and uh, what is the name, Lara? I do not want to uh, <laughs> screw up the uh, the troupe that they uh, oh, the Théâtre des Vampires. Yeah, there you go. You you <laughs> you say it so eloquent. Just I say the Vampire Theater. <laughs> the Vampire Theater. It is the Vampire Theater. But in this iteration, I really fell in love with it and what they did. And the visuals and how they were able to do it. There's so many people involved within it. And you do get more insight upon it in comparison to the movie. Probably more so in the book. I have not read the book, everybody. So keep that in mind. But I, it kept me engaged into the story. And by the end of the show, it went so quick. And I'm like, oh, my God, I wanted more. You know, it was <laughs> one of those, like, I wanted more. But the the show it was very it was done very well very theatrically and i did enjoy it and on top of that we top on the relations of claudia and louis how louis and armand met and their love and i and i just we'll get into that more later on in casual talk and then on top of that uh malloy's inputting his own life into during the interview and then Armand and Louis actually pointing that out, like pointing fingers. It's one of those poker things, <laughs> which is interesting. And I had a love for this because it was eye opening to the relations that they had. Uh, whereas last episode, it was kind of confusion with Louis based upon Claudia's diaries. But with this it was yeah. more very descriptive of what's going on and i did enjoy that and i i love the characters i loved where we see where louis is we still see traits of where he was before uh claudia wanting to learn more and then embracing more things that she wants and then there's more of her just embracing the culture that's out there and a little bit more of armand and I, it's like, I'm starting to fall in love with Armand. You know, he, he's so <laughs> beautiful that that actor is amazing. I, I just love him. You know, uh, Assad Zaman is, is a beautiful person. Yeah. But, but that's just me. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so how many stakes out of 10 do you give it this episode? Uh, stakes out of 10. I definitely give this an 8.8 .8 stakes. <laughs> just for the fact that you know the the visualization the uh the story the love within it and what they give us of each character 
it, it really yeah. it, it really put it in there too and if uh those listeners are are not subscribers of amc plus please do so because they have an aftermath thing and they go into great detail and it's amazing so i highly yeah. recommend it i tend to like those exclusive exclusive you know back, behind the scene kind of yeah those back the behind the scenes stuff that yeah happens and kind of we get that deeper like explanation and we're like oh that's why they went that direction so i do like that yeah i would say too. all right so my general thoughts mm-hmm. um i actually love this episode this was actually my favorite episode so far from this season and of course we're only two episodes in um the introduction to the um vampire the theater of the vampires was incredible the dynamic with uh, Daniel Malloy and Armand now in this interview, I'm very intrigued to see. I honestly feel that Armand is up to something and I don't know what it is, but I feel like he is up to something. And I'm wondering if he's trying to coerce the interview to go a different direction and Daniel is catching on to this. And he's trying to like say, like, what are you like? This is supposed to be me and Louis, not me, Louis and Armand. And it's like, he even says it, you know, are you guys going to be like talking in unison? Finishing you know, and it's each like other sentences. Yeah. Like, um, so I'm very intrigued to see what that happens. Yeah. Overall, I, I, I give this 9.9 stakes. Oh, okay. How about you, Laura? Wow. Yes, I guess I'm I really good to be the Debbie episode. Downer this time because <laughs> right. I was not imp- <laughs> as impressed with this episode as the as the last one or any of last seasons. Um, because last season was amazing. But you know, I I liked it. I was glad that we got our introduction to the Teatro de Vampire, which is sort of an iconic part of this mm-hmm. whole series, the whole vampire series. That's when Louis and Claudia met, meet their first vampires outside of Lestat. I liked that we got to to have the meet cute as they called it with Armand as they're trying to build this up like a a rom com or something like that. I wouldn't <laughs> say as a as a person who likes to read romances, I wouldn't have called that a meet cute. I'd just call it a meet, but still, it was kind of cute. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, but I think um, I really liked the production, even though I know they shot this in Prague. It it is a good replacement for Paris in the 1940s, which is the really cool time of Paris. It was, there was a lot of Bohemian culture and everything. And I love that they bring that in with the, with the theater cat crew and everything. And it it just has this very cool, like Bohemian feel like when they were driving through the streets of Paris on their little Vespas, I was getting kind of like a, a West side story feel to it. It almost felt like they were in a musical or something. Yeah. Um, I think the one thing that I'm just really missing is that Lestat energy. <laughs> I mean, Louis is great. Armand, Armand is great. But I I mean, Lestat is the ring, the ringleader of this entire show. And I just I really miss seeing him and having his over the top energy. I think Santiago brought a lot of that over the top energy this time. So that was nice. But yes. If I was to rate this episode, I'm going to give it like a seven and a half stakes out of 10. But that just means we've That's got too terrible. six more episodes to go for it to get much better. Yes. I think Santiago actually like stole the show within mm-hmm. the, the vampire theater, in my opinion. And I thought it was amazing. Yeah. I, that I thought yeah. Is Ben perfect. Daniels is amazing. And the way he was able to portray it, how he was able to give it, just to give kudos to him, uh, it, just to give praise. Uh, honestly, it, I just fell in love with the idea of the character. It was a little bit more uh, like out there in comparison to what we got within the movie, in my opinion. But mm-hmm. as far as book wise, I didn't read it, so I'm pretty sure in everybody's minds who have read it, probably put it even more grandiose. Yeah, I can't remember how extravagant or flamboyant 
Santiago was in the book. I just know he was kind of Armand's right hand man. But I've heard in interviews with the producers that when they were writing the writing up the kind of outline of these characters, they had two photos up on the wall of actors that they specifically had in mind for characters. And one was Eric Bogosian for Daniel. And the other was Ben, what's his name again, Mark? That would be Ben Daniels. Yeah, Ben Daniels. And they want they really wanted him to be Santiago. And so they like specifically wrote dialogue for that actor. Yeah, he I I think he executed it properly and gave it what it needs to, especially when he was feeding on or playing off of uh of uh Delaney Hales. Mm-hmm about this you know especially because he was trying to feed into her admiration and wanting to be part of the troop yeah and i thought it was great and delaney hales actually uh just give a little bit of kudos i thought she was amazing yeah yeah i thought all the performances were really good in this episode i still feel yeah a loss for bailey bass but (laughs) that's just me (laughs) (laughs) yeah me too i just do but i can start seeing her uh Delaney more and more as Claudia each each episode. Yes. Yes. So in my notes, Santiago for me was the best. I mm-hmm. I had this conversation uh with my friend Billy about how I didn't like Santiago in the in the movie. Mm-hmm. Like he came off too goofy and just I don't know, it just was really off. So being introduced to Santiago in the theater. And just his performance was just so unique and just so just like how it just played off. I just really loved his character and he did an amazing job as Santiago. I again, yeah, like Laura, I don't recall how interesting he was in the book. And yes, he was uh, Armand's right hand man. Mm-hmm. Um, but in the show, he is portraying Santiago. This character is or this actor is doing an amazing job portraying this character. I enjoyed his performance. Just, I laughed a lot during his (laughs) performance. Um, I am liking Claudia a lot more than I have in um, in last season or even in the movie. movie. But this time around, uh, Delaney is doing an amazing Claudia for me. Yeah. And just just in general, everything... (laughs) that she brings to that character has been great uh especially towards the uh towards the ending when she becomes kind of enthralled into this new coven of vampires Mm -hmm. yeah Yeah. how excited she is and everything i i wrote Mm -hmm. in my notes this is this is claudia's gap year like she's having a gap year in Paris and she's met these cool kids. She doesn't have to hang around this nerdy vampire now who doesn't even like to stuck on human blood. She can go hang out with the yeah, cool vampires, yeah. the cool theater kids. And she's just yes. like, I love it. <laughs> I feel so bad for Louis because even Armand said it in the very beginning about how he was taking pictures. Literally, it was literally him taking pictures of time and just mm-hmm. to pass the time, but to get snippets of life and things of that nature and just to pass the, the feeding time in which we still see Louis at, at some points getting putting baguette and some feed out on the balcony to suck from a pigeon or, or a bird mm-hmm. just to, to survive because he doesn't want to feed on human blood at that point he still he does tell armand that he feasts on human every other day yes just to sustenance for it Mm -hmm. yeah so he is eating human blood he's just tries to refrain from it whenever possible he's not as whiny as we thought as we (laughs) think before you know i I keep saying that and using that whiny feeling but it's him holding on to his human self i think and I still think even till to the point he, when he's talking to Malloy during the interview, he's still holding on to human traits mm-hmm. to some degree and showing respect to humans. Whereas Armand at that point was an ancient. And this is where we do find him encountering Armand and 
it, it, I just love how Armand actually just describes their meat cute in the park at night. Yeah, I think one of my points is just their whole arrival in Paris and how they both felt about it. Like at yeah. first when they're sitting up on the statue, Louis talks about it almost poetically. He has yes. this just very young poets, artists view of Paris being this place that's a little bit downtrodden from the war, but is building itself back up. And, and Claudia is just sitting there looking through her purse saying, you know, maybe they came to the wrong city because she can't find enough money when they're pickpocketing people. And, you know, she has to steal twice as much so that they can get by. And uh, by the end, it's almost reverse. You know, she's the one who's happy and loving it and having this great time with this new coven they found. And Louise a little bit like, yeah, he's happy. He's met Armand. He's definitely crushing on him, but yeah. he's thinking, Oh my God, what have I gotten myself mixed up in as they're driving away from that Chateau and it's on fire and you just hear this person screaming in the background. Well, the conversation between Armand and Louis during that time, it's like, there's no, they're not paying attention to all the, chaos mm-hmm. that's going behind in that chateau where they're trying to pull somebody for the next theater of the vampire to do a show with so that way they kidnap somebody and have them so uh, oddly you know uh, you know listeners honestly we said spoilers if you haven't watched it <laughs> obviously you know but in the very beginning when they do go through the whole theater experience it's to me that was it was very ingenuitive with with what how they did during that time that's something that i love as on a visual perspective for its time and it was very interesting because they even stated that they put a uh, film on top of the actors and they had to interact so the vampires are actually doing these stories within on the stage with a projector behind them projecting something animated which mm-hmm. yeah I don't know if that was something that happened, but if somebody out there knows if that's something they did at that time, I want to know because that's so Disney. That is Mm -hmm. like so Song of the South, not to bring up a really (laughs) bad movie from Disney, everybody, but it's interactions with the animation and then continuing a story. And I, I love how the vampires in the very beginning Santiago actually states what you see before you is real. And then they they explain to uh, Louis and Claudia that who are patrons of the uh, the theater that that show up are shoremen, people that just thrive to come every week for every show mm. because they just embrace it. it it's one of those uh, vamp fans, I guess you would call them. And they they want to see what's going on, but yet everything is real. But by the time you get everything is story plot and kind of they're very much uh, integral to the story. And they do all these uh, theatrics to make it look like it is theatrics. And by the time we get to the very end, the last scene that is absolutely real and true. That is what captivated me in the end and the fact that they they took this woman and there's she's screaming from the back and santiago actually states it again stating that this is real and yet these the audience members are just like no nah, it's not yeah he basically yeah. <laughs> tells the crowd that they're complicit in anything that happens on that stage yeah i find that very unique and then mm-hmm. uh, there's the after show thing where they show claudia and they show louis <laughs> well i think that's why claudia stays is so enamored with this because she's like they're eating a human on stage and they're flaunting it i mean in yeah. her mind it's total <laughs> vampire pride she's so happy that they're not having to hide in the shadows well they do yeah. have to hide from the group and yet they have to hide who turned them because once they're questioned that is a oh. problem so she brings up the last person that she heard of that turned somebody. In Actually, the, she I, brings up Bruce, yes, the Bruce. vampire that she came across while she was away yes. on her college years. The one who sexually assaulted her on the train. She wasn't brings it? up his. No, it was in the in the woods. In the okay. woods. Yeah. 
my mind he meets is... her on the college campus and yeah yes. she realizes he's a vampire the only other vampire she's met besides Lestat and Louis at that point which she brought up last episode too by the way yeah she's all like all the vampires i've met are assholes <laughs> Yeah, Can I, I know. I forgot find... to bring up the fact that I she did meet one other female vampire, Antoinette, but that was basically just Lestat's side piece. So I guess she didn't consider her a good female vampire role model. Role model. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. When they brought up the painting and their reaction to that, and Armand was talking to Lestat at the end there about like. Oh, it's interesting how you reacted to the um, the name Lestat, you know. So obviously something's up, but keep in mind the coven is not too kindly on those who lie to them. So I'm very intrigued to, my notes say, I wonder if they heard the thoughts of Claudia and Louis about like, oh, we know who he is. And they're mm-hmm. like, keeping that hidden um Mm because we all know what happens to claudia so i wonder if this whole you know them like welcoming them back to make them feel welcome is more to have them lower their guard as Mm -hmm. opposed to them actually welcoming them welcoming them back as a friendly gesture because i feel like in the end this this whole thing is going to play out that way is Mm -hmm. that they really they knew that they were a part of uh, Lestat's death, in a sense, even though we all know Lestat's life. But yeah, it it's one of those things where I'm wondering how much information they actually know and how much information Armand knows, because he plays it off as like, oh, you need to close your mind better. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. and it's like, okay, well, maybe Armand knows more than he's letting on mm-hmm. um, yeah. to us, the audience. But yeah, I'm intrigued to see where, what, what they actually know versus what is actually yeah. shown on the screen right now. And I think we shouldn't assume that everybody listening or watching the show knows what might happen to Claudia. And I say might because who knows, they may change things because they've been yeah. changing things. But also, I have a feeling that Claudia has more confidence in herself than she might actually have because she tells Louis that she scanned all of the other vampires' minds and they weren't they they had no suspicions. Yeah. But you know, how old is Claudia and how She's old is our mom? Yeah, so that might just be a bit of youthful um ambition, thinking that she is smarter than all these other ancient or at least older <laughs> yeah. vampires. But she yeah. seems to think that they have no clue that they were lying. But I felt even as she was talking about Bruce, they were looking at her going, I don't believe this at all. Like yeah, they she may has not too much know bravado that about Lestat it. is their maker, but I yeah. don't think they believed her story about Bruce. No, no. It, yeah, it was exactly. Too much, it was too much bravado about, mm-hmm. uh, l- let me tell you our story. It's like, yes. all right, well, you're not the elder. He is. Mm-hmm. Well, mm-hmm. not visually, they would look at that as uh, Louis being the elder because he's older looking. But maybe but we they saw have... the father and son in the in the theater troupe. The, the father looks older <laughs> than the son because oh, he wanted yes. to wait till he was on stage before he took the dark gift. Yeah. <laughs> I that thought was that funny. was amazing. I thought that was a, a, a nice little trick to us, but yeah, I did enjoy that. I think it's funny because there would be moments where they were speaking like a foreign language and then Santiago would be like, this is an American play or something like that. And then they're like, change over to English every uh-huh. time something like that happened. I would laugh. <laughs> and then the because in was, reality, or, this should all be in French, right? They're in France. They all yeah. pretty much speak French. Yeah. So it should all yeah. be in French and subtitled, but they're being kind to uh, the audience and not making us read every single episode <laughs> in subtitle. Honestly, I have subtitles on regardless whether it be English or not. <laughs> <laughs> right? But I do like that they they give a nod to the to the audience saying, hey, you 
we have our American friends here speak in English rather than like speaking in English and us just having to assume they're pretend speaking French or something. But you would still get the story visually anyway and understand it from how they're doing it from a visual standpoint with with each story they have theatrically. I I think people would get it. It's just that with us as the viewers of the the show interview with the vampire, (laughs) they did that as a courtesy for those who go, I don't want to watch and read subtitles all the time. (laughs) <laughs> well, they even did it last episode, too, with the Romanian lady, the Annika. You know, she she spoke broken English, but she basically they were subtitling everything in Romanian. And she's like, oh, I speak English, broken English. So you won't have to keep reading subtitles. Yeah. <laughs> let's see here. Um, let's go over to when Louis went over to the lawyer's office and oh. we've got that poetic that poetic letter from Lestat. I was mm-hmm. interested in the whole fact that I wonder at what point Lestat wrote that letter to be handed mm-hmm. to Louis. And I think it's during that time when they were having a little spat between Claudia and him because he was seeing last season and we saw it with him and that woman. And then he did that music, that song that was recorded. Mm. I wouldn't oh, be surprised yeah. if he because he's able to fly and do something and there were there was like a large portion of time that Lestat was gone from Claudia and Louis and I wouldn't mm-hmm. be surprised he's within that time he was able to travel across to do that and to write it or he would be able to write a letter to get it to that yes. area. All yeah. the books you know about these lawyers, they it is a lawyer that he first finds early on in his vampire life who basically takes care of all his legal matters. So it's interesting yeah. that they're bringing them into the show. They're not always, at least in the first two books I've read, they're not always a huge character yeah. in, the, in the stories, but I do see why they brought that lawyer in. He's so like a familiar or or somebody who yeah. watches over them. Yeah, and he takes care of Lestat's finances. Yeah. He, and I'm just intrigued of- just yeah, I'm just intrigued to see cuz um in that letter like he talks about like if you are reading this then something terrible has happened. We're no longer on the same plane and you know don't seek revenge after the person who killed me or did away with me like just live your life but i'm just in, i'm interested to know if Lestat had like knew maybe claudia would have something to do with his demise yeah the separation of them or he's just in general thinking like oh i know the world is full of the wrong kind of vampires and eventually some one of these vampires is going to come between us you know so i i, I definitely want to see what that what uh-huh. stands behind that letter yeah i yeah i've i wouldn't be surprised if he started writing that maybe when he suspected or when he knew that claudia and louis were plotting against him yeah when or they were in the even house. Yeah. after he after he was supposedly dead, who knows? Because I think yeah. that's a really great uh, guilt trip to be laying on Louis there. <laughs> it's a good ploy. Uh, yeah, I, I just love that aspect of of what is it's the mind games that Lestat likes to play with mm-hmm. that we all know. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. Know. And we know that they've been they were in Paris for five months. I can't remember how long that lawyer said that it had been between the time that he spoke to Lestat or had word from Lestat. Do you remember that? Because he said, Oh, I the haven't lawyer, heard from him. Yeah. The lawyer said the la- the lawyer said the last time they heard from Lestat was when he was having money wired to the or he was having the lawyers money wire money to him for the party, the Mardi Gras party. Ah, okay. The giant party okay. they were going to have before they left New Orleans. 
But okay. who knows if these lawyers are covering for him or not because he is their best client. So that is they true. could be they could be a part of this ruse. I don't know. But it so many things seem sus to me in this um <laughs> show. Like I feel like we're getting so many half truths, and I feel like we are getting a lot of them from Armand and Louis to Daniel. <laughs> Yeah, it is. Because yeah. Daniel feels like there's something rotten in Denmark, and so do I. Because one of the things that is weird to me is Louis and Armand's relationship. Like, mm. there's a like Louis, or I mean, Armand keeps going on about how we've been together for 77 years. Isn't that wonderful? And he grabs Louis's hand, and he like snuggles up next to Louis. And this to me just feels like the jealous girlfriend who doesn't want her boyfriend or boyfriend who doesn't want his boyfriend thinking about the old boyfriend. He's just like, Oh, we've been together for so long. Kiss, kiss, love, love. It's so obvious. And then then he adds that's 44 years longer than Lestat. Ah, Yep. I I was going to say that. Yeah. 47 more years. Yeah. He was so petty about it, but also when, and Beloy brings it up, he goes, Oh, so you both were Lestat at different times armand was there <laughs> before you louis and mm-hmm. it's like oh okay so a little bit of truth is leaking out to maloya during the interview of lestat and how he was more integral to their coming together but this will also lead on to something later on at a certain point when Malloy is approached by Lestat. I would not be surprised if we get another season where it does not center around guess who? Louis and Armand. It's going to center around Lestat. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I see. I, I, I foresee that coming up. Yeah. Yeah, I just really find it funny that they're so chased with each other and then you see Lestat with Armand or I'm sorry Lestat with Louis and he gives Louis a gift of a song he wrote him sung by his side piece that he's cheating on him with and Louis swims the Mississippi River to go have anger sex with him so you get that and then you get Armand and Louis like giving each other pecks on the cheek when they go to bed. Yeah. I just feel like Armand has some jealousy issues maybe going on. Oh, yes, definitely. I could see him being the jealous type. He is the ancient, but he doesn't have to drink as much in comparison to Louis. Yeah. But he he rides in the idea of he has Louis under his control to some degree. Especially with this yeah. interview, if you think about it, that it, in comparison to what we know from the movie, Armand was not there. But in this case, he is here. So he is yeah. in Louis' head, manipulating, helping out. So I'm curious as to what the truths are that are there and what are not. So I'm, I'm mm-hmm. assuming that as the season unfolds, there's going to be a little bit of treachery between Louis yeah. and Armand. So that's you just know, me in speculating. My mind, <laughs> yeah. In my mind, when Daniel's like, like joking about like all this, like, you know, Louis pain, I guess. Um, and then all of a sudden Armand kind of goes into his mind is like, well, Alice, she, you know, So this is more about Alice and not about Claudia, you know? And it's like, in my mind, I'm like, is he trying to course this interview to his liking? Especially when all of a sudden you have like Daniel, like blink out for a moment. And then you just see Armand looking at him. I'm like wondering, like, does he have this ability to manipulate someone's thoughts and maybe like erase things that are happening? So that in my mind, I'm like, okay, if he's doing that to Daniel, did he do that to Louis to blank out any negative things that Armand did? You know that or, or Claudia too. There, there are things that, uh, if you recall from the last episode, Louis was a little bit skeptical about his interaction between certain people when they went to that uh, that place. 
and mm-hmm. and it was from her journals and yet he goes oh i have to retract and go back because from her perspective it was different in her diary in comparison to louis thoughts maybe armand was changing that because he knows something that maybe claudia has actually brought up to armand or armand had read in her mind at that time and recalled it and had all that information Mm -hmm. so there's a lot of manipulation within it in this especially when they get malloy involved and uh, talking about love and everything else regarding paris uh i love that armand states that paris was an awakening for louis and his hunger uh, according to Armand, but when Malloy states that Paris sucks, even though they mentioned that he proposed to his wife in Paris, and then he states that his wife divorced him in Staten Island. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there's like um, a lot of duality that's going on. Is a duel of like true love and what their feeling of love is and who they are. Right now, obviously, Malloy doesn't have his ex-wife with him to really challenge that amongst these two vampires. But you also have somebody who is quite controlling of the situation and somebody who want, is trying to give up information, which would be Louis. Armand being more the controlling one, I think, of the, uh, the conversation or the interview at this point. And I think Malloy is catching on to that. And then when Malloy challenges it, they throw it back at him. But that's just yeah. my point of view of what's going on, because we're only getting Louis's uh, perspective and then Armand's tidbits of what was going on within their first interactions. I wouldn't be surprised that 90% of that is true, but there's got to be some play in there that is not true that we oh, have yeah. not seen that we'll probably see later on at a certain point. Yeah. I feel everything in this um, interview could be scrutinized because yeah. for one, um Armand and Louis are being way too saccharine with each other. They're they're yeah. cute little hand holding and everything. It feels very forced. And then um I think they show in the previews of last episode when they're sitting in their bedroom, Armand says, We'll have him saying what's next in no time. And after we have that little segment where Louis and um Daniel are kind of sparring with each other, trying to bring up hurtful memories to each other. And then all of a sudden you get this little cut and Armand is in Daniel's head and he's telling him something about him as a young boy selling playboys on the playground to his friends. Mm -hmm. It's like, why is Armand popping into Daniel's head like this? What is going on? And the next thing you know, Daniel's saying, so what happened next? So he basically did what Armand told Louis he would do. Mm -hmm. So they are definitely playing in his head right now. Yeah, they're trying to yeah. manipulate the interview to their own benefits and try to eliminate whatever they don't want. Mm-hmm. So, and who knows who's going to come out on the end to helping out? Will Louis attack Armand? Will Armand attack Louis? Will they both attack <laughs> I, Daniel? Yeah, who knows? <laughs> right. Well, you know, he is but- kind of sickening. He, he's kind of sickening at this point, and we already went through that whole situation where people who are emotionally dying causes issues think about it you know the they're dying inside emotionally and it it causes and it's bad blood yeah last season uh lestat wouldn't drink the blood of the man who had cancer he said it was poisoned so they're 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 making him more healthy what to consume him at a later point (laughs) Dining um, on a fine wine, as it were. <laughs> <laughs> so we know that at some point, Lestat's going to come back. And mm-hmm. this is just a prediction for me, which would be kind of a cool. So writers, if you're listening to this, this is an amazing suggestion. Mm-hmm. Um, it would be interesting if, like, at the end of the season, Lestat shows up in Dubai during this interview and then, you know, Lestat kind of walks in and is like, so do you really want to hear what actually happened? 
and then like that's how the season ends and then we just kind of go into uh you know the third season and Lestat's there and he's kind of clearing up all these things that Armand might have altered and then we kind of get to see maybe the truth and kind of in a different because I know that I mean at this point we know that this is all Louis's point of view and mm -hmm. I guess now we have to add Armand's point of view um and the future kind of hope to Lestat's point of view and so that would be kind of a good segue for them to kind of be like okay this is this is what actually happened you know this is not a whiny vampire you know whining about his poor poor emo life you know it was actually better you know <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so basically happen. daniel you're trying to say at the very end of this we're gonna get a jerry springer <laughs> show <laughs> <laughs> that would be very interesting well because you know we we all know that armand and uh, had a relationship together yeah and, and and um again my friend billy kind of gave me some insight of like what lestat did to cause armand's distaste for lestat mm -hmm. um so it would be a unique situation to have them, all three of them, you know, in the same room, you know, seeing like how they play off of each other. So mm -hmm. that would be a really interesting dynamic. It would be. I'm I think looking forward to seeing those three vampires together. Same here. Yes. I, I, I think in what we're going to be getting, and this is just my thought alone, is that we're getting the story of Louis was in the very beginning for the first season. Now we're getting interjection from Armand influencing into Louis's story and them both telling. I think come next season, we'll integrate and go more, more into what Lestat would be. And I wouldn't be surprised if Lestat shows up at a certain point. I don't think he's going to show right away in the third season. I think he'll probably show up mid to later in to introduce the other, which is the bad person, because these are a series of books and we haven't even gotten into uh, Vampire Lestat at that point. This is still Louis' story. This is still Armand interjecting. This is still, we got to get through this whole Claudia issue i think at the very end of the season we're probably going to get to the end of claudia and then where louis continues on after that and then halfway through the following season we'll probably get lestat show up and in some way who knows what will involve within that because the writers are going against a lot of what was in the film or in the book at I think in the book I haven't read so that these are just my over overall views of what they would do in screenwriting and storytelling within these characters they're all they're all making us love Lestat and Armand and a little bit of Malloy too showing a little sympathy towards him of what he's doing which is literally his main story but if they do away with Malloy after this it's going to be somebody else's story and who's going to tell that story? The only yeah. person I could think would be Lestat at that point. Or am yeah, I thinking too it, much into it, Lar? <laughs> I don't want to give away too much. Plus, also, I never know what they're going to change as far as future storylines. And yeah. I've, I've only gotten to the second book. I'm, I'm waiting for the third book to show up in my Libby Q. But um, <laughs> I think next season is going to be heavy on Lestat's because I it will so be based too. on the vampire Lestat, which is his retcon of his life with Louis and, you know, also telling maybe some of his origins and um, other stories that happened before he met Louis. Yep. Like Queen of the Damned was for uh, the film adaptation his history yeah how he became to be 
but where we get that story from is going to be interesting, whether it be Lestat himself or from Louis and his recollection. Or does, yeah. at the very end of that season, do we get Lestat show up out of the blue mm -hmm. saying, yeah, I've been sucking on rodents, pigeons, <laughs> derelicts. You know, we know that in Vampire Lestat, the book, he writes this book as a deterrent because Lestat's like, Louis, what are you doing? This goes against all our rules and these vampires are going to come after you. So he... He writes his own story mm -hmm. as a, like, to get the heat off of Louis and onto him. So, um, and then we kind of get, we jump into his origin story. And we kind of get a little bit here and there in the first mm -hmm. season when he's having dinner with Louis' family. He kind of gets, mm -hmm. he kind of talks a little bit about his family. So, um, I hope we get to get to see his origin story um because i'm very interested in his re relationship with his mom um and just everything that comes with Lestat. so i mean uh, either way whatever i'm sure the writers are going to do good because i mean even <laughs> we don't even get in the first book we don't get you know what's going to happen in the next episode you know mm -hmm. where we kind of get to see armand's portrayal of Lestat. so We'll see what one, happens there. One thing that was in the books that was neither in the film nor the nor this adaptation, which I wonder how they'll deal with it with his backstory, is that we don't get Lestat's father. Because hmm. in the books, Lestat is caring for his aging father in New Orleans. He brings him to oh, Louise's estate. And he that's right. also, um, you know, I think he dies. He dies in at Louise estate, but he has his father with him when he comes to, to New Orleans. It was not put in the movie or this series. So uh, I wonder if we will even get to see Lestat's father and brothers in his backstory. Be interesting. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. One thing well. I also was really intrigued with is the way that Louis and Claudia are seen in Paris as opposed to how they were living in New Orleans. Uh, like they had a very posh life in New Orleans because they were living with Lestat, but they seem to have more freedom now that they're in Paris because Louis says, you know, he he's not afraid of being lynched or told to sit at the other end of the counter. And it just shows like the difference in cultures. Um, yes. Even when they were in Romania, they, they were a curiosity, but they weren't despised like they might be back in the States. Um, they just didn't have that same history. And um, in Paris, they're almost considered um, really interesting because they're Americans. And he's like, if I show that I could play a trumpet or something, you know, the people in Paris think they, he's going to be in a jazz band. And, you know, that was kind of huge <laughs> back then, the yeah. jazz bands and I mean, even Josephine Baker was a famous American um, performer in Paris, and she was a, a woman of color. So I just find that really interesting that they're, um, the fact that they're Black is still integrated into the story, but it's a completely different feel in Europe than it was in the United States. Yeah. Yeah. Well Malloy actually stated that at one point, saying it's more acceptant. He goes, uh, Louis states, our skin did not attract the same attention it did in America. And Daniel's like, right, because there wasn't any racism in the mid 20th century France. And Louis goes, oh, <laughs> I didn't say that. And Armand says, uh, he didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, I found it very interesting in the sense that, yeah. It was more acceptable because they were considered more of a very unique for mm -hmm. the area. And whereas in America with slavery and the history of slavery, that's what is uh, riddled with that with an American history and folklore and everything else. Whereas in Europe, not as much. There was slavery, oddly enough, in Europe. But... Yes not as intense as it was in America. So at least they give and a it little... ended much longer. 
uh, much sooner yeah. in Europe than it did in the States. And it they did, did yeah. not have the level of segregation that we had here. Yeah, a lot more yeah. acceptance, especially in England, because y- you have a lot more Indian uh, culture in England than there is in the States. But I would say there was probably a lot of tension between the Indians and the British. There is. There there still is to some degree. Which yeah. which is sad. But the thing is is that at least there there's a lot more Indian culture within that. And it is largely a little bit more accepted now in comparison to them before. Uh, I'm glad that uh you know the shows like this expose certain things like that that a lot of people who sometimes I'll say it myself, I have, I have a naive uh, uh, knowledge of certain things, but I'm glad that they give us and gives that they shine a light on it a little bit. And you need to be exposed to that. You know, a lot of people just show an ignorant eye to it and just want to believe whatever they want to believe me. I'm very accepting of a lot of things, but I'm also prone to uh, taking in, some information that I didn't know before, but you know, mm-hmm. I, I'm I'm glad that they they actually integrated that within the show itself. Yeah. All right. Let's go into the segue of quotes. Mark, do you have any quotes? Oh, a few I actually did throw in there. <laughs> one, <laughs> uh, I only have one that I already in, integrated one. That uh, a couple of which uh, one I have that is interesting. Uh, it's Claudia when they are both outside and he's they're taking pictures of one uh, one another, and Claudia stating, "Who are you, Louis?" And Louis goes, "I'm your brother. Who are you outside of me?" Meaning, it's like an eye opening about Louis outside of what he does for her and their life together outside of that. How do you present that to the world? So I thought that was very interesting and it was a good way of her to actually state that. Yeah. And I think we enough of that because I did like when they're sitting out there and she asked them that question and then he's like, well, she's like, what are you doing? And then he goes on this tangent of what he's doing. Mm-hmm. And then Claudia's are like, you know, some people would just, want the short version of that <laughs> i can yeah. stop laughing i need to keep that in my back pocket because there are so many times where i'm like sometimes i just want the short answer that is true. <laughs> i'm having conversations with others <laughs> well i really liked um armand's description of dating lestat and said he tasted like vermouth and annihilation <laughs> Oh, Armand, you're so dramatic. (laughs) (laughs) Annihilation. He has exquisite taste. (laughs) And I love when um, uh, they're talking about how they met and and also when um, they look up and Lestat's portrait is on the wall and instantly Daniel's like, oh, it's a telenovela. And he starts to turn on the... The soap opera music, and he says, Pass me the tequila and the popcorn, turn it to channel 300 something. It's a Univision night. Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. The soap opera music really got me in that one, too. I love that. Yeah, I think it's from, um, oh, I forget. Ah, I knew today what it was from, but it's Young and the Restless. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> do, do, I just like, do, do, do. like I did not see this coming. This I, I should have seen this coming. How did I not see this coming? <laughs> <laughs> Dad just was so snarky about that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's the part where Claudia, you know, talking to Louis about how much in love he is with Armand and he's he's all like no we're not and she, I hate to say this this burger thing but he's she's all like she's all like uh now I know what two cocks sound like and she goes <laughs> oh wow yeah yeah that shocked me too I'm like wow. damn Claudia also, <laughs> right? that was, I was surprised that, that they even ran that on the show I'm like 
Uh, you know, one thing you cannot say about these writers is that they are not afraid to to say the things that are shocking. They'll they'll throw it out right. there. <laughs> or, yeah. or throw it in our, our face of what we think. And um, people <laughs> yeah. who are ignorant or naive about certain things when it comes to sexual orientation or whatnot. But they're also, you know, they're pushing the boundaries, which is really cool, which AMC is doing at that point. Yeah. Sometimes I feel they're like reaching into the Quentin Tarantino bag of dialogue. <laughs> For as some long of the, they don't show some of the rougher the things they say. <laughs> yeah, they can't show all the feet, though. You know, what's that, with that. the feet? <laughs> yeah, that's a Quentin Tarantino thing. <laughs> oh God! <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, I, mean, it's I, an was, I think thing. I was recently rewatching the first episode of the first season, and there's a scene with uh, the guy, the racist man who um, Louis kills. What was his name? Alderman Fenwick, and um, the yeah. prostitute at the beginning, and she says something, and I was like shocked again to hear it <laughs> i'm not going to repeat it but go back to episode <laughs> one of season one and i'm just like damn so, so they're those, risque yeah, this should so, be on hbo <laughs> well so those of you listeners out there do not watch this this is not a family show <laughs> this is a more adult oriented show i'm pretty sure your junior high or middle school kids are probably watching this going I can appreciate this because they're probably a little bit more advanced as we were as kids at that age. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, they're probably all watching Euphoria anyhow. It's fine. <laughs> right. Probably. <Yeah. laughs> I haven't even watched Euphoria. I don't think I'm an adult enough to watch Euphoria. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Do you hear any more quotes? No more quotes from me. Those are all mine. Yeah, I don't have any more on my end. Well, the only one that I have was Louis saying to Claudia about, and this is in the very beginning, saying truth is more valuable if you take, uh, if it takes a few years to find it. And that's literally about her pickpocketing people within Paris and what they have to do to survive there. Mm -hmm. And they, they <laughs> go into this whole tangent about how, this woman was looking like a derelict, but yet she had the best lipstick. Yeah, new and, lipstick on. Yeah, and how uh, Paris is is growing at that point. It's on its way up again. Yeah. As far as just like some random notes, uh, I felt. Did you guys do you watch it with the ads or not without without ads? I have AMC Plus. I don't have uh, regular cable, I so have... I watch it regular. Okay, so did yeah. the editing just feel super choppy to you? Because I remember in the first season, everything seemed very flowy. Like they didn't stop for, they didn't edit for commercial breaks. Where this one, this episode in particular, it just felt very obvious that there were cuts for commercial breaks. There were definitely cut fade outs for end of scenes that I could tell. Yes. Yeah. But, and when you're not yeah, watching that... it with ads, it just feels so weird and choppy. Yeah, they, they yeah. really need to do something for that. But I think when they throw it on AMC Plus, they just do it as as it is mm -hmm. with the chops. Yeah. But if they yeah. if they were a little bit more fluid and they grab more people who want to subscribe to AMC Plus, I think they should fade out and fade in a little bit, not to be yeah. sudden with the uh, yeah. the scenes. Yeah, when you're streaming it, it just feels weird. It's like, why did they stop that scene so abruptly and then start yeah. it again so yeah. abruptly? Yeah. And then the scene at the lawyer's office when um, Lestat suddenly shows up, did that not look just like Brad Pitt from the movie? I, <laughs> I At least I thought it immediately. I'm like, oh, my God, he looks just like Brad Pitt. His hair yeah. is longer this season. Sam's hair is longer this season. So he... When I saw him, he looked just like Brad Pitt's character in the film version. I think they're preparing us at certain points, too, for when they go from there to when we get yeah. to that point of seeing Vampire Lestat. And I'm looking forward to that. I'm curious of what type of music that they actually go in that, that respect. Yeah. Because in, in uh, Queen of the Damned, yeah, spoilers, everybody. But if you haven't seen it, it's available out there. It's on Tubi. It's on Amazon. It's on a whole bunch of streaming platforms right now. But 
it was a merit for its time. I would love to see where they put it within the time that Lestat actually does that. Is it the 70s? Yeah. Is it the 80s? Is it the 90s? Who knows? And I yeah. would love to see. Uh, at the time when, uh, you know, like I said, Queen of the Damned came out, I think it was more of like corn and all that kind of music, <laughs> that yeah. heaviness that they were trying, well, to, and the goth-based stuff. I haven't Psycho watched negative. that in a long time, but I recently saw the concert that Lestat does as played by Stuart Townsend on stage. And he looks so much like early nineties, um, Trent Reznor in his yeah. like sheer black shirt and everything. And I even felt like the songs felt a little industrial to me. So yeah. I guess we'll have to see when it gets to that point, how Lestat is portrayed. Yeah. In I this would love era. To see it. Yeah. 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 Will it be a Pink Floyd kind of thing? <laughs> <laughs> Will it be uh, early 80s metal? Can you see uh, a young Bruce Dickinson <laughs> as, as a <laughs> Or would you see uh, maybe a Rob Halford? Who knows? Or maybe do we get a want to be Pete Steele from Typo Negative? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah it, who knows uh, i i would love to see the transition it would be interesting to take it from a different music perspective in comparison to heaviness i yeah. would think of more erotic or uh oh I'm, I'm thinking of like oh i'm thinking of ooh, some of the uh ladies of lilith fair kind of style of music lara hmm. folksy <laughs> folksy yeah it would be interesting <laughs> to have that at that point i would ask my teenage daughter what's popular in music now but i know her biggest kick right now is watching like eurovision contestants oh it'd be so funny <laughs> to see eurovision as a vampire <laughs> he's european why not why not yeah i think we should mm -hmm. mention that we have one new uh another new important character who was introduced uh, and that's Madeline. And in the books, she's a doll maker, but in the series, she's a dressmaker. Yes. And I wonder if they will actually go into her story. I mean, the reason she falls so in love with Claudia immediately is because she lost a daughter. And I don't know if it's going to be the same story here. Claudia is a little bit older in this. Um, so I don't know if she'd have that same sort of attachment to losing a young daughter and then finding this attachment with a teenage girl, or if it's something else, but instead yeah. of having a doll made for her, Claudia asks to have a dress made for her because her main hang up is that, you know, she has a, the body of a child and she wants to be a woman. Yeah. 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 You can see that longing and wanting, and I already see this attraction of Claudia towards the dressmaker. And I'm thinking that's where it's leading to. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm, I'm, looking forward to that storyline and like i said uh we we don't know what's going to happen next episode yes we don't get screeners everybody so <laughs> but if amc wants to send them our way you're more than welcome <laughs> to thank you <laughs> anyhow I, I think we're good with notes uh, as far as what yeah. i think i have lara is that all you had that's it danny same here same here well, with that, we'll, we'll move into some feedback that we got. And we got some feedback from our friend Sam. And here it is. Hi, it's Sam. I figured I'd do a voice memo, voice feedback for the episode. Oh, my gosh. This was such a great episode. I loved it so much. I just finished watching it, and I think I want to go and watch it again. I'm a big fan of the movie. I've read some of the books as well. I loved season one. All the changes are just phenomenal and I love it so much. And how the show is leaning into the homoerotic subtext. I mean, they're vampires. As Armand described, they're not picky about their lovers. They're just like, uh, who's willing? You know, <laughs> <laughs> they, like gender is a construct, especially if you live forever. So I, I just, I really appreciate it because I always read that in Anne Rice's work. So I like that the show has leaned into it. And season two, I mean, I, I knew that they were going to do a good job. They've just, 
gone above and beyond for me. I love it so much. I was nervous about the Theatre de Vampire, and they did amazing. Ben Daniels, oh my gosh. I watched that scene like four times. His scene where he's talking to the audience and that that poor woman. And I mean, I, I didn't know if they could be as iconic as the movie scene. And they surpassed it for me. I, I, I Ben Daniels was born for this role. He is incredible as Santiago. I, I mean, just truly phenomenal. Clearly an acolyte of Lestat's with the Thea <laughs> the, the, Trout, the, Trout, uh, the drama. <laughs> and, <laughs> I mean, they're just so. All of them are just so fantastic, and I'm drawn in and following them, and they're just doing such a great job. And yeah, it, it, it's just amazing. I don't even like the theater and I loved these scenes. So I was like, maybe I'd like vampire theater. Like, <laughs> especially when that woman is riding on the motorcycle with Santiago. I'm like, I wouldn't even ride on a motorcycle and she's riding a vampire riding on a motorcycle. I'm like, okay, I can tell you. I mean, I guess if I'd live forever too, that'd be fine. It was so great. Like all the, the humor in here is fantastic. When Louis was like putting the baguette out for the birds, I was like, "Oh, Louis feeding the birds. That's so sweet." Oh, oh, oh. Louis feeding all the birds. Not as sweet. <laughs> it was just fantastic in the murder mansion scene. Oh my gosh, I could do like a whole thing on that. They were amazing. That chaos with the romance. I lol that one scene where they just decapitated this guy while these two are flirting, and it's just. Fantastic. I was Claudia with these vampires, which is odd because we know this is going to end in tragedy. Anyone who's read the book, seen the movie, I mean, I guess not really spoilers. I am curious to see where it goes from here because they have changed a lot of stuff from the books. So, and I love it. I think it's fantastic. So I, I am sus on Armand and Louis in present day. This all feels very odd. Like, I, I don't know. It feels like there's parts of Louis missing. And I'm like, did Armand do something to his memory or something? I honestly have no idea. But it feels suspect as much as I love Armand. So I, I am curious to see where this plays out. Their relationship in the modern day makes me edgy. And I'm not quite sure what it is. So, also, Malloy is a treasure. I think he's one of my favorite characters in the show because he's so funny. I didn't like him being bullied. Can't wait to listen to the podcast. Thanks, Aww. Sam. That was amazing. That's awesome. Thanks. She covered so much, some stuff that we missed, but you know, like <laughs> yeah. the murder yeah. mansion. I loved that because the, I, yeah. I wrote down it was a rom con in the foreground <laughs> and like a slasher film going on in the background. In the background. Yeah, that is true. Yeah. And the fact yeah, that it is it's true. like, it was like that whole little like uh, flirtation between Armand and Louis as they're talking and all the whole, you see somebody go out to the balcony and then you got another vampire pulling them over as they're screaming, sucking on them, pulling them back in. And they have to have this whole conversation. <laughs> if you look at the AMC uh, interview with uh, what was it? Uh, Sam Reed. Oh, no, it wasn't Sam Reed. Sorry, Jacob Anderson. I get him confused. Sorry. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> I'm like, I looked at the wrong name. Sorry. But uh, Jacob Anderson said he goes, he had a hard time because people were screaming in the background. <laughs> and he had a, like full composure during that scene to get the words out because it had to be nuanced in the sense of like, yeah, this happens every day kind of attitude <laughs> and i was just like oh man this is amazing uh i i just love it i i have to agree with what sam had to say about ben daniels and uh, i mm -hmm. i thought it was amazing too i i just loved that character i loved his portrayal of it as well uh the movie was very epic but in this case this was very very theatrical and yeah. uh, a little bit of tidbit about the uh, the actress that was in there that played the character at the very end of that. Uh, that was the assistant director and apparently they were in the process. So if you do go to AMC plus and they talk about at the very end about the episode, they talk about it. It's like, yeah, she was on set and then she was giving call cues and everything else. And next thing you know, she's on set 
And there we are just biting into her. And she's giving this whole great monologue and dialogue about what they did to her. And because she was an actress as well. And so uh, kudos to that actor, actor or actress, if you want to call them that. Mm -hmm. And I I thought it was amazing as well. Yeah. And we also (laughs) find out that uh, Armand is quite the pansexual. He's basically slept with everyone in the theater, including the father son group and (laughs) some sort of acrobatic um, (laughs) display. (laughs) It's yeah. great. And funny fact that if you read the books, the vampires don't have sex in the books. They have lots of sexual, like there's lots of sensuality and lots of sexuality, but they don't have physical sex. Their sort of turn on is drawing the blood from each other and drinking each other's blood. Oh, yeah. Interesting. That's what I recall from it, too. Mm-hmm. Huh. But they're definitely going at it in the show. <laughs> hey, hey sex and sells. we're not against it <laughs> no i'm here for it yeah sex sells that's how it is all right well to submit your feedback like sam has done all you have to do is just leave us some feedback and say hi to us and send us a email or a voicemail at talk at podcastica.com if you head to our to podcast.com, there's a handy uh, voice message link and you can check us out on social media like Facebook and that would be facebook.com forward slash podcastica or you could go to Twitter and that would be at podcastica and Instagram at house podcastica. Now, if you are an Adrenaline Cinema listener, uh, podcast listener, all you have to do is go to Adrenaline Cinema Podcast at gmail.com. You can do the same thing, write out a regular email as always, and we'll read it. Or like Sam, you could just record yourself and send it as an attachment like I got. Uh, oddly enough, I did get this through Adrenaline Cinema Podcast. So uh, <laughs> thank you, Sam, for doing that. Yeah, that was awesome. But if while you're at the podcastica.com website, if you haven't already, please check out all the other podcasts on the Podcastica network, like uh, Still Slaying, a Buffyverse podcast with uh, Penny and Kara and occasional guests like, <laughs> like Sam or myself <laughs> or Steve Brown. So uh, they're currently covering season three and they're going to be moving on to other things. Uh, Another shout out would be uh, Welcome to the Apocalypse. And that's a uh, kind of, what would you say? uh, Zombie improv. Mm -hmm. Yeah, an improvisational group storytelling about after the apocalypse with uh, Randy and a whole bunch of other people. Uh, They've had a lot of people on from podcast get on there recently too. So I do enjoy that. Uh, Lara, do you have any others that you would like to suggest as well? Well, Lucy and Jason continue their rewatch of the walking dead on the cast of us. And that's been really fun to go back knowing everything that we know now about the walking dead and how it ends going back to the beginning and recapping it with, all the knowledge that we currently have. It's, it's been fun to listen to them. Danny, do you, do you have anything to suggest to as well on podcast or anything else? Well, you're covering the dead boy detectives. Oh, so, yeah. And that's a really good show. Yeah. You could hear me uh, and Jamie on podcast doing the dead boy detectives that was on Netflix. So uh, we're doing it episodically. So we're doing episode by episode. So. I think by the time you get this, episode five might be out, or maybe you're in between four and five. So check that out if you can. All you have to go to is House Podcastica on Spotify or iTunes or Apple Podcasts. That's what it's called now. Yeah. And then um, you could also check out TV Podcast Industries, too, which also covered uh, Dead Boy Detectives. They're covering a whole bunch of other things as well. They're a great uh, friend of Podcastica, as well as Adrenaline Cinema Podcast, Panels to Pixels Podcast, and Pyrocore Entertainment. So uh, check that out as well. Uh, next week, we are covering Season 2, Episode 3, I Want You More Than Anything in the World. You think that's from Armand? Our, our needy little Armand? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Probably. All right. I, I think that covers our show, right? Yes. That's a wrap, theater nerds. <laughs> <laughs> I guess don't get bit really helps in this as well. Oh, <laughs> true. Unless you want the dark gift. Yeah, that is true. All so. right. I want to thank everyone for listening. I'm Danny. And I'm Mark. I'm Laura. And this was the Vamp Cast. Thanks, Thanks for, for listening. listening.